Thank you, sir. So I was thinking about the earliest days, five conferences ago, of this event, and what a wilderness it felt like in those days. I mean, intellectually speaking. It was really, the ideas were unformed, the language was unformed, the logic was unformed. It was incredibly hard to think. Not only did we not have answers, we didn't have clear problems. And sort of the organizing question was often, wait, what? You'd see people like stall, you know, somebody would be working out the arc of an argument and then they'd just kind of lose their nerve and their place and the thing would, it was like watching the Soviet, the earliest days of the Soviet space program when, the, you know, the engineering was, was hopeless and every flight was an act of great courage and uh, people were just risking it with every, uh, with every adventure. Um, and it had that, in those early days, it really had that quality of just trying to work the thing out, just trying to get the basics down. I mean, what was wonderful about yesterday was that that wilderness, that wildness, uh, has gone away almost completely. Uh, and now we live in a much more, uh, you know, world that's really much better organized and the problems are clear and lots of disagreement, clearly, as, as there must be for something this fun, the questions this fundamental that touch on so many political and moral and personal issues. But there's great clarity uh, in, in this intellectual endeavor now. And it made me think, it made me wish for uh, models that would help us organize the debate in a more organized way. Which is to say, it seemed to me that some of the debates that were happening yesterday were arguments about, you know, is it X or is it Y? Is the explanation or the factor, is it X or is it Y? When, it seemed to me at least, almost always the answer was, yes, it's X and it's Y and it's probably Z to boot. And, and what we need is a model that lets us keep all of those factors in play as we, as we think about this space and, and how to think about uh, this space. Um, so I wanted to take two terms that came up yesterday in the subtitle of the first session. We uh, the terms value and meaning uh, came up. And uh, these are terms we tend to think of as mutually exclusive. Value be belongs to economics. Meaning belongs to culture. Value belongs to marketplaces. Um, uh, meaning belongs to creativity. You know, in, in, as heirs to that great German 19th century distinction, uh, that love to treat those things as mutually exclusive. You, I think we're still haunted by that distinction. And it seems to me one of the things our model, our, our global, our organizing vision of this space might, might do is treat those things, value and meaning, as, as, as having this intense mutuality. So that value, it seems to me the model we need to build to understand this world now is a model that shows how value becomes meaning how meaning becomes value, how they are constantly provoking one another, constantly converting one into the other. And I was thinking of uh, Parmesh, uh, those of you who are here for the Thursday night intro, Parmesh gave this wonderful treatment of Bombay, uh, his Mumbai, um, and talked about people coming from the hinterland uh, to Bombay to, to remake themselves, to reinvent themselves. Um, to take up a new identity, indeed, actually to fashion the identity that they're taking up in, in Mumbai, in Bombay. And uh, you think how much culture begins exactly there. It's a fantastically personal gesture, uh, undertaken for fantastically personal reasons. It's to create who you are. It's to create how you see the world. Uh, and we're really, you know, that's meaning at its, and often that's the, the, the birthplace of the meaning that then takes on larger cultural significance, right? It's somebody's very personal act of self-invention that creates the meanings that then enter into a community. You have a community helps shape, shape it and define this meaning. And this meaning then, to play out the, the Bombay case in point, enters into uh, a Bollywood picture as both value and meaning, and through that picture, it enters a global culture and an international marketplace. And through the, that 
uh, movie, and then the people who go to see the movie, it descends into a club, say, in Chicago, where it plays out uh, for several reasons. For reasons people are fashioning identities there in Chicago, uh, and they are also just looking for things that are good to dance to. So the invention that begins in Mumbai finds its way up into an international uh, culture and, and back down into uh, localities everywhere. Um, and the act of cultural invention uh, uh, continues. I guess the, you know, for just the most fundamental reasons um, that we want to see the mutuality of value and meaning, the, the most fundamental reason I think we don't want to treat them in that German 19th century manner as mutually exclusive categories is that they are now so mutually enabling. You know, de Saussure used to talk about um, uh, meaning or talk about signification. He, he said, you know, these, these, these things are so mutually presupposing that they are like two sides of the same piece of paper. You cannot cut one without cutting the other. I think that's what we're looking for, at least that's what I'm looking for, is a model that captures both value and meaning. So the question is, what is the model? Oh, there is, for those of you who are interested, I don't know if Ian's here, but there's a wonderful uh, paper in the anthropology literature by Nancy Munn called The Magic of Gawa, I think it's called. I'm not, I might not have that title exactly right. Gawa, G-A-W-A, -A, is in the title. And uh, it's about uh, how Gawa canoes take on cultural and give off this cultural significance um, with several kinds of meaning converting one into the other in the process. It's really a magnificent piece of work. But I think yesterday, sorry, Munn, Nancy Munn, M-U-N-N. So yesterday we heard several things that you know, we could build into this uh, model. And I love Jam and Warren's notion of ecosystems. I love the Thursday night discussion of uh, how cities serve as relay stations for this mutuality of value and meaning. And crowdsourcing, it seems to me, is all about how we convert value into meaning and meaning into value. It's really, in some sense, it's an exchange. Crowdsourcing is like a bourse, right? It's a classic kind of exchange for, for conversion there. And we just take that for granted. Um, the value and meaning are both operating. Uh, we, we, we can begin to detail how it is they interact with one another. Naturally, and I think properly, we're concerned when, 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 when our meaning or someone's meaning is turned into somebody else's value. That was the great preoccupation of, it's been a great preoccupation of popular culture. It was the great, great preoccupation of the 1990s. Um, but it, you know, happily, the good news here is that the new media give us new instruments of shaming. So when Liam Gallagher switches hotels in Rio and sticks his, his hosts with the bill, you know, that gets, that actually, you know, knowledge, news of that gets into all of those people who have created that event in Rio, and they take it personally. So the, the sort of bad boy, the bad behavior of the rock star is no longer a private event or kind of you know, a, a way of sticking it to the man. It's now a public offense, and it, and, and it gets public kind of declaration in a, in a very useful way. Another example here um, might be the Huffington Post, which recently crowdsourced a design project in a really sweatshoppy kind of way. I mean, they're clearly taking advantage of a commoditizing design marketplace. And that instantaneously ran through the, the design community. The de design community noticed, and they, and they punished Huffington Post. Uh, in, an inst in an instant, Huffington Post uh, was worth less. I mean, it really cost it financially. Now, the interesting thing about financial markets, of course, is that they're always precising of fantastically precise valuations on things that you know, are, are, are hard to imagine capable of, of that, those acts of discrimination. Um, but in this case, you can, you can actually calculate what that act of crowdsourcing cost them, and you, we can be certain at a minimum that what it cost them was vastly more than anything they saved through the act of crowdsourcing. <sighs> For my money, the discussion of privacy yesterday was way too lawyerly. It seemed to me to abstract issues of privacy out of the context of the social and cultural context that make them matter. And in this case, precisely, I think we know 
that people trade, are trading away their privacy for access to networks, which networks give us a social capital and social identity of a kind we cannot live without. So if you're under 35, the, I, you're prepared, I think, to sacrifice a good deal of privacy. The, you know, the alternative is a kind of complete enemy. It's, a kind of, it, it's to erase the possibility of a social persona. So um, I think the model would help us uh, keep track of um, the advantages and disadvantages, the benefits and the costs of, of issues of this kind, and to con contextualize um, the way, uh, the, the contextualize the issue of, of privacy. One of the benefits of this model, I think, would also be that it would help us see our own inconsistencies. We take umbrage when someone turns our meaning into their value. But I think most of the people in this room have actually turned somebody's value into their meaning. That is to say, you know, we've helped ourselves to BitTorrent or, or, or whatever. And that's an inconsistency that I think is worth examining. And a model would, uh, I think, make that more clear. Um, once we get the models in place, uh, I think we can escape the heritage of this German distinction between meaning and value. And one example, I would argue, um, is that we could create a venture capital for creativity. That we don't have one is got to be one of the strangest features of contemporary culture. A, a, a Martian who didn't know about you know, that German 19th century heritage would go, really? You've got this thing called Kickstarter, but it's really just a philanthropic exercise. It's a way for people, passionate fans, to support projects they're passionate about. But it doesn't make possible investment and the return on investment nowhere in this fantastically vital cultural creative space is there an investment opportunity, which is fantastically odd. Here's what the model can do. The model can say, here are the number and the importance of the projects that don't get funded because there isn't a venture capital fund at work here. So here's the thing. We now, the Kickstarter model says, takes advantage of fans and the passion of fans narrowly defined. What it ignores is the passion of fans broadly defined. Fans are passionate about what they care about. They're prepared to philanthropically support something. They're also in possession of this fantastic connoisseurship when it comes to judging the quality and the interest and the impact of a proposed piece of music or theater or... Uh, movie making, and for want of that market, lots of projects don't get funded. Which is to say, here's how peculiar it is from the Martian point of view. We're much better at raising a hundred million dollars to create a blockbuster movie that no, you know, that is a confection of the almost most literal kind, right? <laughs> totally unmemorable. You eat it, you consume it, and it's gone. We're much better at raising the hundred million dollars for that blockbuster than we are for raising a half million dollars that will make a pro will allow a movie to go from a really good idea to a reality. That's very odd. That's just sensationally odd. That's when you know we really are the victims of that German distinction, because that should have just bubbled up out of you know all that. What what is Silicon Valley but an exercise in venture capital? And, and, and indie kind of funding. You know, and the fact that it hasn't come to contemporary culture is just fantastically strange. <clears throat> For some reason, we're reluctant to engage the cultural player as an economic actor. We're squeamish on this issue. When value gets too close to meaning, we go, well, wait a second, is it still meaning? I think that squeamishness is really badly placed. I think it really serves us ill. As it is, there's a kind of death valley that exists between the big value players on the one side and the small culture players on the other, between the people who produce or pursue value, the pe people who produce or uh, um, produce <laughs> Todd. Um, Todd's cueing me. It's a mysterious message. I can't de decode. It's like, it's like the first FOE. I, I'm getting a message, but I can't tell what it is. 
So it's like, because we're the heirs to that German distinction, we, we, there, there's a death valley between the big value players and the small meaning players. And uh, we know that thanks to Henry Jenkins' magnificent work, you know, there's a cultural literacy there that makes this, that open, should open up the possibility of that market. It's like, you know, I used to teach at the Harvard Business School, and what I was teaching was people fantastically good at making investments of a financial kind. This room, this program creates people fantastically good at making cultural investments, but they're never engaged in that capacity, for want of which great film and thea the theatrical projects go unrealized. It's because we can't manage to raise a uh, half million dollars. Good things don't happen. And you can just imagine what the, the cascade effect or the, let's call it the opportunity value, when those things don't happen, how much other cultural invention doesn't take place, and the richness that would otherwise be part of a culture doesn't happen, you know, not just Martians would be, would be appalled. You know, I actually managed to work the Soviet space program and Martians into the same, uh, same remarks. So all of this is to say, there are ways of rebuilding, to create an intellectual model that makes some of these problems less problematical, um, is to open up the possibility also of certain real world institutions that would make meaning and, and value flow more readily and, and, and find their, their appropriate destinations more, more urgently, more exactly. It would open up uh, new kinds of culture so I guess I'll just close on this point. In my reluctant Canadian, my bashful Canadian way, I guess I'm calling for better, better models with which to understand the real complexity of the exchange systems we've been looking at today, and better markets with which to apportion value and, and meaning so that uh, we're not obliged to work, work for Kickstarter wages and, and now have the resources necessary to, uh, to stage full-blooded productions. Thank you very much. Thanks.